In this video, you're going to see me uh, have a conversation with a gentleman called Daniel Hinsley, who has or had a history or has a history of 15 years of low back pain that really ground him down to not being able to do very much physically. And you hear his story of recovery where he can now do pretty much anything he likes. And it comes from a very structural basis and um, belief system as to what was stopping him from his pain where that story came from, what evidence he had to put those blocks in place and how he maybe built further blocks over time that limited him. And there's a tipping point in, in which he decided to change the beliefs, then move his body towards uh, the places and times and events that would trigger pain, but in a way that was so graduated he was able to recover completely. If you're interested in another inspirational recovery story and watch this video. We're on right. So um, thanks very much for joining me, Daniel. This is part of a series of, of interviews or chats I've done with patients who may have recovered, may not have recovered from persistent pain. And it isn't an easy fix, otherwise they'd be off the shelf remedies that we just pop down to someone, not necessarily a doctor to get, that would kind of switch it off. But we often find there's a story that means the pain lasts a long time. And I'm interested in your story really um, of what led you to develop the pain you experienced. And more fascinating for other listeners is the steps you took to reverse that process so thanks yeah. for joining me and can tell me a little bit about you and what what has happened yeah okay so um yeah my name's dan i'm 43 just to give you some context um i live and work in the northwest of england um for an, an it consultancy and um, specializing in artificial intelligence which is pretty cool i think um from a, a pain perspective as, as well, so I gave you some context, I'm 43. Mine's journey with pain sort of started when I was around 23, I would guess, and lasted for around 15 years, um, which included periods where I could barely walk, lots of sciatica. Um, re really, I could at some points not be able to turn over in bed, um, been stuck on the toilet. <laughs> not be able to get off just because of the shooting pain so some some really severe pain um and ultimately ended up with me sat with a surgeon uh looking at you know an mri scan showing bulging discs and in my early 20s a um a diagnosis of degenerative disc disease and so there's two herniated discs that apparently were the the cause of all my pain and and sent sent along my on my way to uh, manage it as best as as possible and what were the treatment options offered to you back then? Yeah, so uh, the 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 um, advice I was given was basically, you've got two options: you manage it the best you can uh, with physio, uh, with um, osteo chiropractors, etc., or you have surgery, you do something like uh, discectomy. Um, but they just they said we recommend you you know you're in your early twenties manage it as best you can technology is moving along um, I think at the time they were I'm sure he said something like we're growing discs on the back of rats and we might be able to do some disc replacement in the future so so basically just live with it as best you can and then put off surgery as long as possible um, and hope for the best. <laughs> so and, and for for a young man, yeah. Uh, how did you feel at that time giving that information um as soon as you come out as i remember coming out of the um come picture it come, coming out of the the uh consultation with the with the surgeon just you just think so i didn't know I, at that age as well i didn't really understand what chronic meant so he's sort of saying it was chronic and like chronic as in um so asking for clarification it's not got clarification it's not it's not going to go you stuck with it you know manage it it's not it's not going to fix and, and and when you're in your early 20s you think you're bulletproof and I was very active very fit just it was I can just remember this feeling of like I'm 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 screwed <laughs> I'm gonna be I'm gonna be uh 
you know, disabled it, by the time I'm in my thirties, if this is the state I'm in now in my twenties. So I think that, that in itself, you know, that expectation that someone in a white coat can set and set off a pattern of beliefs um, is really powerful. And uh, I don't think sometimes people in that position of authority understand the power of what they say. Um, but yeah, so I was devastated and set off. I think ultimately, though, um, like super positive chat, I'm like that. No, I'm not having that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna find some way of de dealing with this, <laughs> uh, and being really driven to try and find a solution. But initially, it was like just, just a panic and depression, and like trying to accept that this is what you've got to live with. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not good. And what did that look like? So let's say you're, a, I think I read an article that I can share the link to, to people who are watching the, in the kind of text, if you like. But uh, it's a lovely article about how active you were and what you did. So when you had this news and you're given this kind of black cloud and it has a kick on with how you feel psychologically as well as how you feel physically, what did that look like then? Did you stop some of the things that you were doing? Did you avoid them or did you push through? Yeah, so and initially um tried to push through um and it and, and kept repeatedly getting hit with pain. Um so I think things like back then I was playing on football, not not to your standards. Uh, we haven't seen it play. But yeah, so if I was playing football and I had to stop that. Um any running stopped. Uh I was quite into the gym, just I had to really reorganize what I did in the gym uh, I stopped playing football and started playing golf because I thought that might be better couldn't I would play golf and two days later I'd be I won't be able to walk so that lasted for about a year or so before I had to give give that up and then sort of became this long list of things that I believed I could and couldn't do um based on experiences you know you something simple as bending over and picking something up and getting searing pain down my legs and thinking, oh, well, I can't, clearly can't bend forwards and then sort of building in this fear around bending forward. So it was it was almost like the way my mind treated it was starting to like work out what it could and couldn't do and then create this list in my head of, of what was possible and what wasn't and, and determined to be active. Um, but the list got ridiculous. Like I could swim um, front crawl but if I tried to swim breaststroke, I'd be in pain for again for a couple of days. So it was just like I had this ridiculous, not not physically written down list, but mentally that I, I've come to appreciate later. I had this crazy list of things that I believed and couldn't couldn't do. Um, yeah. And each of those thoughts triggers a feeling. Mm. Yeah. But you don't always get good at feeling because the fear covers it up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So if I'm good, if you if you take the breaststroke, for example, as soon as you start to do the breaststroke, you're anticipating when the pains are going to come on. Mm -hmm. And that means that the pain is more likely to fire with the anticipation of it. But that's an invisible process. The person doing it can't see. Yeah. And it obviously triggers frustration because in the context of swimming, think, God, well, I'm swimming front crawl. Why can't I swim <laughs> breaststroke? And then the, the fix-it brain the kind of problem solving brain that with a tunnel vision of I need to work this out mm. goes looking for the structure. Well, this mustn't be possible because there must be some damage that they've missed or it's kind of doing something that I can't see. And, and, that, and it kind of entangles itself in the fear and frustration loop. And that neurochemical fires the pathway that the person's tangled in. And it's that kind of cyclical ever decreasing circle that develops, isn't it? I would agree, looking back, that's what was happening with me, yes, for sure. So how long did this so I, happen? I, I spent about 15 years in in pain. It wasn't 15 years of constant. It was 15 years of episodes, regular episodes. At, at its worst, I think one year I had about I don't know, two months where I wasn't in severe pain at its worst. But other than that, it was like episodes that would come and go. And um, yeah, and within that period, so everyone you could think of, chiropractors, osteopaths, physios, multiple physios, um, 
Alexander Techniques, doing yoga, um, all, all, all sorts. Had shoe insole replacements. And <laughs> yeah, and you know, you know just exploring everything. Like you said, looking for that physical physical solution to a, what I presumed was a physical problem. And what, the, and, the, and what I was told, I think the biggest damage was that I was told by a surgeon that it was a physical problem, you know, and who am I to doubt that? That's... Um, yeah. Um, that's that was the, the big thing so you believed it you know I didn't that that bit was already a given it was just how I deal with it that I was trying to work with not not believing that I could actually that it might not be true or I might that might be an opinion or I might be able to reverse it so I spent 15 years of just trying to trying to manage and and doing it really positively and with a it wasn't you know a really positive mental attitude to try and sort it um but yeah just just missing the point really that it could potentially be reversed <laughs> and all these people that you show your pain to brilliant people brilliantly trained people yeah um obviously their own perspective on that pain and you you'll have been given about 15 different variations of that absolutely pain. yeah yeah leg length discrepancy yep sort of place facet <laughs> this uh, root uh kind of something wrong with your forehead yeah, your shoulder's the wrong height. One eye's bigger than the other. I'm yeah. told, obviously, but don't... don't, don't I have the leg length. I had the leg length one. Yeah, and, like listen, five millimetres. <laughs> I've joined in with this. I understand. Yeah. I'm a little bit on the other side of the glass now, but I was on the other side. I'm not criticised. I'm just saying I was unconscious of the processes we were dealing with. Now I've become more conscious of them. So um, if you can see the, if you just look at the pain, I think you miss the person. Mm, absolutely. If you look at the person and you take a step back, which you can do now with the experience that you've had, and so could lots of those people you've seen now. If you went to what, see them all again, I bet you 90% will give you a different perspective on your pain. Mm. No, I'm sure mm. of that. And if they didn't, maybe that that's okay. They may be seeing it as they see it. And it's not right. Quite or possibly wrong. though, you know, if someone had given it, I wouldn't have had taken it on board anyway. If someone had said it's 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 anything to do with emotions or stress or or, or um, neural pathways, neural pathways, I, I would have. I, there's a good chance that I'd have just ignored them anyway. And yes, it, it felt so structural. Yes, and that hierarchical uh, structure we have of who gives you the knowledge in our culture is very powerful. Mm. So if I wanted some information on artificial intelligence and IT systems and you told me about that, uh, it would have credibility. If my wife told me about artificial intelligence and IT, I, I, I wouldn't criticise her with their information because that would get me in trouble. But she'd have less credibility than you. Yeah, yeah, maybe not. <laughs> in fact, I'm more likely to believe her <laughs> quietly. And then yeah. come to you say, Dan, is my wife right? <laughs> <laughs> and if she was wrong, I wouldn't even tell her she was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but this hierarchy in a white court is yeah, yeah. really powerful. And so you're in that spectrum of experience that has a really strong belief system given by a man or a woman with evidence of a scan and it kind of showed you it. Mm -hmm. It triggers the fear system and the frustration system and you almost embed that with do's and don'ts. Mm -hmm. The flares you present to Mrs. Smith, Mr. Smith, and, you know, uh, physio, chiropractor, osteopath, they do their best. Mm -hmm. Temporary relief, a settled acute system back in the pattern. Mm -hmm. What changed? What what got you from where you were to where you are? Yeah, so I, I was, um, like I said, I, I, I did have this sort of like positive attitude that I didn't want to accept it and I would regularly Google and I know you say you shouldn't do this but you know Dr Google did help me um because I was regularly googling like progression I was looking for these new discs on the back of rats <laughs> to see what 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 advancements there were you know every now and again I would just be googling back pain therapies um uh, latest science whatever and I came across um a bunch of um doctors and evidence and uh, uh, uh that, that talked about this mind body connection um and it was termed so my mind body connection and the whole theories seem to be um around the fact that your, your your mind and brain can cause pain that feels 
very real and is real uh, is is real pain but just not structural i sort of so i found that on one of my googling um trips and then sort of there's there's books you know including your, your the yours and uh, there's youtube articles etc so i started to look at look at the material available and just got it um the way i say it is usually i got it conceptually it's like yeah i understand how that can happen and then but but that's not me you know my mind's definitely structural i can feel it structural you know <laughs> uh and uh and so i sort of read it and read the stuff saw the saw the videos and then just like not ignored it but just i had that sort of in my mind but but yeah i suppose i did i parked it and thought that doesn't that doesn't make sense and i think i think there was some recommending recommendations for some journaling exercises in, in there and uh I did a little bit of journaling about some things that happened in the, in the past and it, it just got me depressed. So I, I, I put it away and uh, ignored it for a couple of years. But then I guess the thing that that started to happen is I started to notice patterns. Um, how, basically, I think now looking back, I think I sort of put the information in the head <laughs> and then it sort of just sat there resonating and, and I started spotting spotting things that were happening. For example... Uh, in in the IT industry, I was in a period at work where things just kept changing. Like new manager every quarter, new it just it, it does change fast anyway, but particularly fast for a few years. And I just noticed that every time there was a change, I was getting flare ups. Um, and I'd, uh, and just slowly, slowly, I started putting two and two together. Like, is it just when it's stressful times, it seems to be worse? Um, and then I started revisiting it properly, like the work that you know that I'd read about started actually doing it pushed past the miserable journaling and sort of started doing a number of the exercises which for me just self-education about these new theories and concepts and then also actually a lot of journaling exercises about understanding how I'm adding to my anxieties and stresses and um and like spotting thought patterns which come up from from journaling which I found really useful uh, personally it, it, it's a it's kind of a transition isn't it you do I'm sure you will have read about kind of book cures mm. yeah oh, really annoying because it took it, me a couple it, of years it, oh really annoying <laughs> that's interesting yeah, really annoying, it's like overnight like that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. why I then, have, I know, and I know people who have recovered um, yeah. um uh, Saying it's um, it's clearly not annoying it's it's wonderful but it's frustrating when it took me ages <laughs> it is it is interesting those epiphany they're, they're called epiphanies yeah yeah huge emotional <laughs> charge a huge emotional charge the flip side of it yeah. um why it happened i don't think you can create one of them and force it it has yeah. to it just happens it's a rarity it's fascinating to observe in the moment fascinating mm -hmm. it's uh sounds like a flying pig when you hear about someone reading it I, I know someone i know somebody overnight yeah yeah um it's almost like show me another flying pig <laughs> flying pig's not possible show me another one and i might and you yeah. show them two they'll say no no i need to see three yeah i'd have been one of those <laughs> <laughs> so that's okay but they are rare um however for more the 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 natural distribution curve is that we fall what is it 96 percent is it or something in this the normal there's a there's an outliers at either end mm. so we really recover quick most of us have the potential to recover um there's a, there is a small proportion that um struggle but everyone can do it it just means there's different things going on at different times of people's lives mm -hmm. and um when you're in it and hear these stories uh, depending on where you are in the curve, it might help you or hinder you. So I think to hear a, a gradual story, the paradox here is you was talking about 15 years. So somebody who's a year in could actually watch this and think, oh my God, have we got 15 years? That's that's not necessarily the case. Yeah, um, and some it, it, the timeline isn't relevant. It's when you reach the tipping point. There's a tipping point, isn't there? So yeah. what was your tipping point? What do you actually do 
And what did you notice? Because yes, you had an awareness, that, but you must have done something where you took control. Yeah. So the tipping point was that was that noticing period of um, that something that I just noticed the patterns. Things were changing, um, and every time a new new manager was involved or something like that, I would get severe flare ups. Um, so I went back to, I think the first, sometimes you read, you read books and you get all the advice and some of them are practical things you do. And, uh, well, certainly this was me anyway, I read it, but didn't actually do other than that little trial I'd said of, the, of uh, journaling, for example, I didn't actually go and do, um, what, what it said. So it's just like, I understood it, but didn't do the work if, if you know what I mean. Um, so I, I, that, that that was the tipping point for me was the, seeing the patterns and then starting to explore them, saying right, okay, maybe I should take this seriously. And and, and I think the period, so it wasn't fifteen years of it was fifteen years of trying to manage it. Actually, from reading that book until recovering was probably about two. It's about two years for me, um, and it was I, I put it down to the fact that I had fifteen years of programming to unpick. You know, you know, my 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 synapses were well and truly wired together, and it took a longer <laughs> longer time to unwire them. Um, but that was it. Yeah, so I went back, and first, the, one of the biggest things for me was to start to look at. Um, I don't know if you've seen this journaling exercise. I mean, a few people talk about it, but where you look at your um, from birth to now, all the stressful events along the top, or life events along the top and then put it against any ailments any illnesses along the bottom started to map map things and things started to become evident and then the journaling process is is just um the one i the one i read about was just free writing about that area at that time it turns out you know at that time in my early 20s i was a new job out of university just took a big old mortgage wife pregnant um and then if i look further back i had um a good friend of mine die um, quite horrifically when he was 18 and I was 16. Uh, I've got very religious parents that have put, um, uh, lovely parents, by the way, but um, just some things in the religion didn't sit quiet with me. And I just, there were things that were happening from a, like a, I might like call it trauma nowadays, don't they? But just like life events that I had not, I'd realised now looking back that I hadn't processed, sort of put just, like you said at the beginning, you know, not feeling stuff. <laughs> that I think that comes with that part of the problem is that super positive attitude is, is sometimes I, I would suppress things and including what, what transpires through the journaling was that I, I hadn't grieved properly. Um, I hadn't dealt with certain uh, beliefs that were imposed upon me and hadn't, I hadn't worked them out for myself. And, and, and all this sort of came out through this, this journal ex exercises and I sort of, for me, I, I see it now as two layers. I see, I see it like I had that all these like deeper repressed emotions and stresses on one layer, and then another layer of beliefs around the pain itself. Uh, so I had these like character traits that were causing me to 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 be tense and and um, and not deal with not feeling emotions. And then I had a second layer on it, which was the I built up all this years, this list of things I could and couldn't do for 15 years that had sort of created their own pathways and, and become true to me. Um, and so I could only, for me, the, the best thing was the writing about both those different layers and starting to, I just found that this, the, the act of journaling just sort of slows the brain right down and gets what's in there out on paper. And then once it's on paper, I can start to analyze it. Uh, and that's what it was. So that's uh, what I've just talked about. Took me what, a couple of years to work out through lots of that, writing about the things I was noticing and experiencing. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? That timeline, I call it a timeline. Hmm. And um, when somebody is curious about it and even sceptical and says, oh, well, yeah, I don't really believe that. But I say, well, okay, just let's see how you get on with what you're going to do. And um will incorporate a b or c as a kind of treatment protocol but whilst we're doing this if you just curiously have a look back on your life at the time that your neck pain started or your ibs started or your achilles tendon tendonopathy came on or your you know whichever pathology you presented with um just go and have a look at that now they don't have to leave the room before they started to do it mm. <laughs> there's 
sometimes people will prick up. You'll see them go in the mind. You'll see them disappear. Yeah. And But it's all about planting seeds. You, you couldn't stand up in front of a crowd of people who had persistent pain and um, you'd see a few of them huffing and puffing of what you've said so far. Mm. And uh, even if you had to sit with each of them and say, look, some of them would be shaking their head and say, you're a madman. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, but, but and that's probably okay. I would have done as well. <laughs> yeah, it's, and me too, as a clinician for 20-odd yeah. years, I used to say to people with persistent pain, oh, well, you're doing your exercises, let's manage it, and we'll help you with a flare, but we're not we're not going to cure this. We, well, and what I understand from what I've said is we can't change the structure, but I didn't know how we could change the patterns of behaviour around the structure. Mm. And when you see it more as behaviour change rather than tissue healing, you don't have to change the structure. Well, one of the key things as well, back to that question about the flashpoint, um, was reading another. So one of the articles I'd read was from a, another surgeon who understood the approach, you know, that, that, that we're talking about. And um, he just described this case of MRI scans showing bulging discs. And and I think you've present, you present as well. Uh, I'm sure I've seen on uh, your work, the stats around um the amount of people with bulging discs and herniated discs and compared to who's the amount of people in pain and um just the one phrase that it's that if i if i mri scan people i will find normal abnormalities and that that, that it suddenly clicked for me that that yeah so what they've done is i've gone and said i'm in pain i'm in pain i'm in pain i'm in pain scan me they scan you find something that's completely normal and then say well that must be it and then you go right now. I've got something physical to work with, uh, and and I think it was that re- hearing from somebody else in a white coat. Unfortunately for me, I need I needed some authority figure to tell me, but um, somebody else in a white coat saying that's a normal abnormality. And uh, once I'd got that, that actually I could scrap that MRI scan because it was irrelevant. Then mm. then that really that really opened up as well. So it was that belief. I think yeah. Once you've switched the belief to actually this this. I am contributing to this. Then you can start to work out the details. Um, so I think, and I've questioned myself that as well. How do you get people to shift that belief? And I don't yeah. know why I'm trying to tell my story as well as other people do. Because yeah, well, let me help. give you <laughs> let, let me give you an example that I use with patients sometimes. Do you know that um, if you have you got children, Daniel or not? I have. Yeah, you might be yeah, able yeah. to hear them shortly. Yeah. So imagine the five or six year old. They come into the front room, and it's December the twenty fifth, and there's a half eaten carrot on the mantelpiece and half a glass of milk. And they will swear blind that Santa Claus has been in the house and Rudolph. Yeah. And they will swear blind, right? They'll em- re- reinforce that, say, look at the footprints on the, and look at the presents under the tree. And I've and I, and I seen it. Nowadays, they'll say, I've seen him on my app last night <laughs> into our house. And I've got a video and he's saying my name. Now, yeah. all of that is really solid evidence to maintain that belief. Yeah. It'll trigger an autonomic response in that child. The pupils will dilate. The chest will go really fast and squeaky voice. And they'll start jumping around and putting on an elf's hat. And you and your wife, or your partner, stood there going, they believe this rubbish. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Now, one day, and I don't want to be a spoiler for anybody watching this who thinks differently, but one day they'll enter the they'll enter the yard room, they'll look at the mantelpiece and they'll half eat and carrot and a glass of milk or whatever is placed on there, and they'll look at you and they'll look for the milk along the, <laughs> edge of the top lip and a bit of carrot. And they'll check the size of the footprints and say, Dad, that was you, wasn't it? Yeah. It's <laughs> a good and analogy, yeah. All yeah. the evidence will fall away. There'll be no autonomic response. Yeah. There'll be a laughter, but there won't be the same level of excitement because it's gone forever. It's gone forever. It'll never, ever get that excitement back on that day, ever in life at the same level. Gone forever. Mm. It, we ca- try and capture it through our children because we tell them the same fibs. I'm biting a carrot. I'm drinking milk I don't even like. And after I've had a beer on Christmas Eve, <laughs> we do the footprints. Oh, do we have to do the footprints? Ah, oh, put it on the app. Get a video. We're all playing the same game now. Fear and excitement are the same physiological experience. Yeah, yeah. And when fear flips to excitement. Our fear just drops and there's a gap in it. 
it's a real huge physiological change yeah. and that actually is quite liberating you've still got to move through the new experience and if the void's there long enough we'll drop back into the fear even moving into the new experience if we get too excited too quick that can trip the fear circuits so it's exploring this new experience being aware that the pathways of fear are just around the corner and easily triggered by adrenaline so that we can expose ourselves to too much adrenaline psychologically physically emotionally where we can control that and that's the path where the, it's a systematic kind of gradual return to the life that we desire. So you've obviously done that. You explained about how, how phys your physical kind of capabilities now. So tell me a little bit about what you could do and what you can do now. It's not a kind yeah. of press up test, but you know, where are you now? Yeah, pretty much. I can pretty much do everything. It took me a while to reintroduce everything. So basically one of the things, once I'd worked out, um, what was happening just through self-education um just started to play with it a little bit reintroduce things you know like well what well, i start swimming breaststroke and you know and and um i'll start bending forward and you know at first i bent over to pick up socks and my back would hurt and then i'd stand back up and i'd bend over again until i picked up the socks and it would hurt and then i'd keep bending over and bending over until it stopped and it did <laughs> So, so I took that theory with everything. All right, I'll start swimming. I'll start swimming breaststroke. It hurt. And then eventually it stopped. So well, this is this is good. And so I started reintroducing everything. I got to the point where I was pretty much doing everything other than I wasn't I wasn't getting much pain anymore. Only when the difference was if I did get pain, it was I knew what was happening, change at work again or whatever. And I could feel the tension and I'd breathe it away, do a bit of journaling and it go. Um, which was all evidence, you know, I built, it, I built an evidence diary for myself, which uh, all this evidence. Oh, yeah. That's that, nice. Which I found really useful. And I kept looking, if I, if, if I felt some pain coming, I would go back to it. Uh, so I started doing that. And then um, I thought, well, I'd really like to try running, but I was still scared of running. And um, so I signed up for a, a half Ironman um, competition just to see what would happen. <laughs> uh, so I signed up for this um, and then started like trying to trying to get running again um and running i found was a big blocker for me i don't know why it was just that i just thought you start you start off running and you think what if i'm wrong do you know what I mean? <laughs> well what if i've got these damaged discs and basically i don't know i'm i'm just you're gonna just gonna do some irreversible damage and i'm gonna end up making things miles worse and these these doubts just kept kept creeping in so I found running quite hard to unpick so but but for me it was sort of the last hurdle um so th that's the the article that I wrote that you mentioned it was talking about specifically this because I, I think when you're fit and active you've got especially if you if you train hard you got this like you get you get doms that you delayed and so onset muscle soreness and and that adds a little bit of a a bit of a grey area because things hurt when you train hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's trying to like trying to is that because my back's knackered or is that because I've I've been mm. in squats or I run fast or whatever. So so I had a little bit to unpick. But I started just like with the same thing as the socks. I set off for 30 seconds. Could run right okay a minute, two minutes and then went straight to 20 and then couldn't walk for three days because like, I was expecting this pain to come in it and sure enough it came. But I just persisted with it, went back again, went five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then built that up to eventually half Ironman. Wow. Sorry, yeah, well, half marathon and then stuck it on the back of a a, a, a larger triathlon to do the half Ironman. And, uh, and that was, that, for me, I, I don't think that's necessary in anyone's recovery journey at all. But for me, it was, it was just, a, I want I want something that, and it, I signed up for the um, Ironman the full I am on after, but luckily COVID came in and, and screwed that. And I think I've got it out of my system. I don't need to prove it to myself. <laughs> I feel, I, I, it was just to proving it to me, really. And and um, yeah, I can do I can do anything now. Absolutely, absolutely uh, anything physically. Um, when you embed those pathways, and yes, they're a bit exciting and fearful at the same time, mm. and uh, it's a bit of trial and error. Because you um, you you're really kind of pushing the boundaries that your nervous system set for you not what you've set generally mm. what you've set are ideals based on programming that you should be doing more than your nervous system says mm. and um so you have to respect that don't you and it won't like some of the things you get to do 
the normal response is DOMS, you'll tend to get an exaggerated response to that, don't mm-hmm. you? Disproportionate. Yes. Not yeah. always in the run. It can feel great in the run. You finish in the next morning, you go, oh my God, I can't walk. So mm-hmm. the, that doesn't mean you're damaged because there was no damage on the run. People misinterpret that thought, I've damaged me back, it's gone again, my disc's gone. They're just the old patterns that fire. Actually, if you look at rationally, you say, well, it can't have injured me. And actually, pain isn't linked to the amount of damage someone's got, which is the underlying belief that lots of people hold. So it's a little bit of rational kind of rationalization of the experience. And then you go again, don't you? It's mm. hard when you're on your own doing that. You have to be the calm, kind of consistent voice underneath the emotional reactions that come with pain. Not yeah. always easy. Yeah, I used I used a few techniques as well. I used like um, visualization techniques. So uh, uh, I think part of my uh, the reason I was in pain because of this obsessive uh, <laughs> the obsessive compulsive attitude of of trying to trying to nail things hundred percent. But I would I'll be in bed visualizing like running and um, yeah, and then I would I would create evidence lists. So right, I, I played football once with my nephews. I'd had a few beers and everyone was saying, oh, you're going to be knackered, you're going to be knackered. And it didn't come. (laughs) So I went in the evidence day and I just sort of created this evidence there, the swimming, the the cycling, the the picking up, bending over and picking up stuff. And uh, I just just kept kept building it and building it and building it. And then and the mantras as well, like on the runs, like just like relaxing, relaxing. And then I started playing with the pain. And I think I've read that somewhere else. uh, So as pains came on a run, I would visualize it, give it a color, move it, shrink it, and, and just playing around with all these things. I, I, yes, my, I'm starting to get some tension in my uh, my, my right glute. And I'll just start thinking about my left hand. <laughs> yeah. No, no, these are techniques. I was running and thinking about my left hand. And it, sometimes it would go. Sometimes, you know, two or three miles later, I've just forgotten all about it. And, uh, and, and then that would all go in the evidence diary. And, uh, so it was either, um, yeah, I think, maybe slightly obsessive or, or maybe I will justify it by undoing again 15 years of beliefs um so it just took a my, my excuse is that it took me a lot of unpicking um but I think I got a deeper understanding of what was happening by having it taken two years yeah. I, I wouldn't want a book recovery I want I want to uh, well and truly uh well and truly established I understand you've had a thorough recovery haven't you <laughs> yeah. how do you feel now? how do you feel now yeah, oh, oh, great, great now, which is, you know, why I wanted to speak to you and um, just help. Just, just I think for me, I, re- I did read some recovery stories and I think it really helps. It helps to see people and that belief um, that it can, it is possible. Um, you know, the another flying pig um, is just, just really, really helped. So I, I just wanted to, you know, get, share my story with anyone else as well to, so that they can avoid 15 years and maybe do it in a slightly less time. Yeah, but yeah, I feel I feel really good and just keen to, you know, to to let people know that it is possible. You know, and I I do know you know a number of people that I've met through just telling my story of uh, who've also um, recovered. So I know I know quite a few. Um, yeah, it's definitely a thing. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a definitely a thing. Well, I'm I'm really grateful you're taking the time to share it. So honestly, it's in, in really engage you're a really engaging guy. It's lovely to listen to. It's a very authentic story. You're very honest. You said what works, what didn't work. You said that you kind of struggled with it and found yourself maybe a little bit obsessive of it. And as you as you let that intensity go, you built you look back on the evidence that popped up. So um it, it, it's uh, it's a bit tweet to call it a kind of a journey and we must pass through, but it's something that um, you do learn a lot through the process, don't you? Yeah, you hear a lot of people saying they wouldn't change it as well. And I think I'm in that camp. I'd like it to have yeah. been a little bit shorter, uh, if I'm honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but actually learning to understand your, and it has a knock-on effect beyond pain, you know, just just watching thoughts come up and emotions come up. Like, it's like meditation, isn't it? Mm. Like watching things come in and realising that you don't have to get attached to them, you don't have to run after them. It, they're just thoughts. They're just um, they're just emotions and emotions can be felt. They don't have to be repressed. And th- these things have helped just in general life being more just happier <laughs> in general. You know, I think... I think um, 
so yeah, whilst I, I wouldn't change it, I, but ideally it could have been done with not 15 years. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think it's um, it has knock on effects beyond beyond just pain. Yeah, I, I agree absolutely, and that's the, my right. experience with yeah. people, patients that, that that they often see a clarity to the light that maybe wasn't there before the pain. Yeah. So thank thanks so much. I um. So just for anybody watching that, that Daniel's story, I will attach the article. Um, don't know how you feel, Daniel, if anybody wanted to contact you on Facebook, you have a profile there or, you know, um, but you, you know, it's, you are an inspiration to people who are kind of maybe uh, in their experience of pain. And, you know, you are an example of a flying pig. Yeah. <laughs> and, and no, maybe... I'm happy. I, I would happily set questions. I think, I think uh, I would definitely happily take questions, but I think ultimately at some point people have to like start to do it. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Uh, but, but more than happy to help people start to do it. Um, yeah, this this is this is an inspiration enough anyway. So thank you, thank you very much. So very much, and that's kind of uh, I'm, we're just going to have a little chat. Daniel mentioned about kind of the stuff we're we're, we're doing. Uh, I'm doing. Um, so if you want to stay on and watch a few minutes of that, that's fine. And thanks very much for joining us. So I'll leave it recording, Dan. So um where so what you what's your story now? Then you kind of you're obviously working and um you, you kind of just training and doing as normal then, yeah. You, your life is getting back to its normal. Yeah, but back to normal, yeah. And then uh, yeah, just just um trying to like you said, like, like trying to find ways of spreading the word really so the article was one of them it's a bit of a nice creative outlet as well something to do um to try and help yeah yeah that, that's it yeah, yeah, brilliant. Work, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. But, but yeah i was quite keen to see about your practice and what you're doing and yeah uh, well i'm a physio uh, tra yeah. a traditional physio i'd have been one of the 15 that you saw and you know done my best for you like it did for 20 odd years and 25 years of physio now so um, I would always be left frustrated by that about 15 20 percent that kind of we'd see in this subpopulation and you'd attach a, some some degenerative pattern to them or actually those some people have no degenerative changes at all the fibromyalgia CFS the kind of um, those that know all the tests show nothing um, so for me to see changes possible in those subpopulations if like was fascinating and I didn't believe myself so um and it came across it more or less by accident I suppose and then to start to explore it and realize it's a uh, lots of what you've spoke about and lots of the patterns you see habitual condition patterns normally from a time in life where we're not conscious of learning them parents and society in general and it's not the people who are teaching us doing it to harm us they're doing it through their own fears or their own protection mechanisms overlaying their fears onto a, a child that really has no uh, it's a blank canvas yeah so it creates behavior patterns in the child that actually have the potential it isn't predeterminism it's kind of predisposition that if the perfect storm appears in that person's life and they have some of the traits of being driven and self-sacrifice and great game face and you know all the things that you recognize now that actually are quite rewardable in some jobs and well suited to yeah. te some technical aspects of work and the person gets a reward for it. But you'll find they got rewarded in childhood for those behaviours or if they didn't get rewarded externally, it, was, it fed the internal reward loop of driving them towards safety. Mm. Yeah. And that's why it, that's why it unconsciously. And what I love about this work is that there's no blame. Because if you present this to someone, say that you were unconscious of your own behaviours, how, how can blame be relevant? Yeah. How how do you find uh, positioning it with people? Do you meet resistance? Because whenever I've, I've I've mentioned it to quite a number of people, a few of who've gone on to study it and recover. One friend who's recovered from years of really bad arthritis, um, you know, to disformation, and and it's gone. Um, but most people are quite. Yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> You're a bit nuts. Um, I, I wondered how it feels on your side when you are trying to introduce it to people. Do, they, do you mean that resistant? All the time. Yeah. Look, go look at your children when they're five or six, right? At Christmas again, and tell them he's not real. 
<laughs> Watch your face. Yeah, yeah. They will start yeah. to cry. They'll point to all the evidence that they've had. They'll say their friend saw him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. They'll say they sat on his knee and they pulled on his beard and it was real. <laughs> they will swear blind. They'll pull all sorts of evidence yeah. out. So what do you do? Do you, are well, you just dropping seeds and? Like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You. It's about plan. First of all, it's presenting a possibility. Hmm. So you may say, oh, I understand th this is you. I've asked about 75,000 people in my career. How, what you tell me about your pain 75,000 times. You have? Yeah, 75,000 oh. times. <laughs> it doesn't mean I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> wow. Wow. But I realized that um, if you, the less you talk, the more you listen, you hear the emotion in the story. They'll tell you it clear as a bell. They might point to the pain. Mm. That's the last place to look. Mm. If, you have to, have to examine that physically. Mm. But it, it fits such a clear criteria now, such a clear criteria when you look at it objectively. But at the point of feeling you've got something really excitable, you'd like to pass this person, you mustn't drop it on them. Yeah. Because their nervous system is in an upregulated state looking for anything that could be excitement because they'll only see it as fear. Yeah. And what, how are you seeing like um, NHS response? Is, are, are there any, I, I think the, only, the nearest I've got, and again, I'm sure from what I read about um, where you studied, um, you might be related to these people, um, uh, the flipping pain campaign. Yeah. So yeah. Carl Mack and I, Professor Carl Mack, Carl Mack, yeah. Ryan, we've done some research together on a little, it's kind of a technique, old pain to go. To, that's probably my entry point. And I sent him some information, some videos. I've done it with patients because the patients would like to say my pain's gone. I said, what do you mean your pain's gone? Because it's kind of an epiphany technique. I'm like, what? So I filmed them and I sent them to Carl Mack and said, Carl Mack, have a look at these patients. I'm talking to them and the pain's switching off. And he said, what the bloody hell are you saying to them? <laughs> <laughs> so he said let's do a study so we did a study uh, a couple of years ago we, we see it's only a small study and we couldn't really say it was the effect it's only a trial or what would you call it a small pilot so we have got ethics to do another study but it really i realized at the time actually that yes that's fascinating but it didn't work with everyone it didn't appear to work with everyone so what is going on so it's not about tissue healing it's about behavior change so mm -hmm. yes epiphanies are fascinating but could everybody access this if you could break it down in a systematic way and that's when i looked at the habit literature and behavior change literature and psychological literature the physio nuts and bolts are kind of more or less new to a degree and once you can feather them together and actually use the body in behavior change you use breath in behavior change you use thought in behavior change and use emotional expression uh, in the terms that you described of journaling or art or music or fun or dance, mm. then um, talking therapy as its place as a concept, but we're actually using the body and the breath and maybe some other forms of emotional expression, but using the body and breath, which fit perfectly from a physio perspective, means that you can more or less provide a systematic way for things, to, for people to follow. However, their, in, their intent with each of these behaviours has to be based in quite a calm, conscious, measured way. And what often happens is people do the breathing and say, I've done the breathing, it doesn't work. I've tried the exercise, it doesn't work. I've tried journaling, it doesn't work. But they're doing it with such an intensity, that's the habit that they're missing. They're already in the reaction and they've missed the gap where the recovery opts opportunity sits so the mm. first part for a lot of people is creating the gap let's see if you can calm the nervous system and uh, there's, there's a guy i saw about four weeks ago he came this week and uh, he said i can't believe it but two four weeks ago i sent him away uh, and i said i just want you to breathe for two minutes he said how often should i do it and if i do it today will i get better quicker i said no just <laughs> every night two <laughs> minutes set a boundary for it symbolizes you looking after you what is that it? Is that all you want me to do for two weeks? You're joking. It must be something else. I said, just show me that you can calm your nervous system once a night for two minutes. <laughs> came back four weeks. Yes, it came this week. So I can't believe it. 
I can sit calmly at work. I go out for my lunch. I can sit with my partner in the room and watch a telly. He couldn't do that. So I can do the breathing. It feels so lovely. I can, you know, you just notice these gaps now. Yeah. But when you're so compelled to be busy and compelled to fix, even a gap is uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. And now we can so, sit in the gap. So how, so how um, do you think the NHS is changing? Do you think? Yes. I, I'd love to get to the point where, if I think back to those initial, maybe it would have been different. Yeah. If I'd have seen it in the first GP, had said, you yeah. know, common, common symptoms have come about from stressful situations. Yeah. Uh, maybe I had, you know, maybe that was it. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are of whether that's changed. I, I don't know. I feel compelled to try and help change things. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, me too. Kind of wrote, obviously, yeah. write the book and this little kind yeah, of side yeah. hustle of doing this. I'm a physio, but I kind of look for it in everybody, if you like. Uh, but uh, about 25 years, so maybe I've been working like this for five years now. At 53, I think it'll be on the. It'll be after the end of my career. Mm. I honestly think it, there's an agenda to give people pills still. Yeah, there yeah. is a change in consciousness about this. You look in any article this week, look in the last six months and compare it to six years ago. It's exponential. Absolutely. That doesn't mean... In the last couple of years, some of the some of like the TV doctors that I've followed and stuff, yeah. they would not have talked about. And no. even this last this last 12 months, you know, the sort of guests that they're having on the podcasts and the shows are like, you know. Yeah, it's just not what you would typically have expected. So I think you're right. I think there is yeah. a conscious change, yeah. I'd like to think I was, I wouldn't say I was a pioneer. I think the people I would. 20, 20 I 30 would. years ago, I think I'm an earlier doctor. Yeah. Yeah, you, you're definitely, you, you, you'd probably class yourself as an earlier doctor. Happy yeah. enough with your own experience to share it with someone else in a room with people that wouldn't believe you, but be able to walk out the room and if you're happy you've helped one person, then that's worth doing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean you blame the people for not agreeing with you. We've all got our own Great, um, yeah. wiring to work through. It ju- you just demonstrate there's a possi- there's possibilities of that. And I, and my work is simply doing the same. Let people f- accept it, accept it or reject it, or curiously kind of consider it, park it, and see what else is there to maybe triangulate and reinforce or reject. And that's enough, isn't it? Yeah, the fl- the flipping pain campaigns like the closest thing I've seen that's directly taken on the NHS challenge of trying to yeah. spread the word, uh, but, and, I've, and I've looked quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, actually went absolutely. to one of the seminars um, a couple of weeks ago just out of interest, just just yeah. to see what it was. Which, yeah, uh, Carmax. You do talk to yeah, so Carmax was Carmax was speaking. Um, yeah. was really good, really good presenter. Nice oh, class. He's a yeah. funny guy. Funny guy. Yeah. Some uh, Carmax, brilliant. So to have a figurehead like that is amazing and it's backed by lauren rosley they've took it as a direct copy of the pain revolution in australia it's a direct copy yeah, is it right? more okay. or less a rebranding but same thing cycle around chat to people community based level uh one one sorry patient level information but also clinician uh sharing information evidence-based if you wanted to explore behind the headlines and it you know that these things take time, but at least there's a movement, and it's nice to be part of it, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it was certainly good. I enjoyed the I enjoyed the seminar. Um, it was really good. Yeah, great. Yeah. I'm gonna let you go, Daniel. If that's all right, it's been absolute pleasure. I'm so grateful yeah, you could of your time on a sunny day, and maybe out of your working day as well. But hey ho, we are it's all right sneaking an hour out of work. <laughs> Indeed. And uh, I, hope, I hope we're in contact, so I hope to stay in touch. And um, yeah, course, I'm, yeah. I'm grateful for the message you passed to the people in, you know, the small community that I share with. But um, maybe it'll go far and wide, longer than, and further than we can both imagine. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? All right. Okay. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, mate. Okay. Take care. Cheers, Joe. Cheers. Bye bye.